Starting us off at number 10 are Dewey's old favorite, dolls. Remember this one? Yeah, so in case you missed a few of our other Chernobyl videos, there are large piles of creepy, most likely possessed, burned up, radioactive dolls everywhere. Where are they coming from? Well, odds are most of these are actually coming from tourists and people looking to grab that one spooky and scary pick for the gram, but no one knows how this all came to be. It's hard to know if this started from actual dolls that witnessed the explosion or if someone just had the bright idea one day to start adding messed up dolls all over the exclusion zone. In the end, we will never know because unless you are a regular there at the exclusion zone, it's hard to distinguish which dolls have been there since day one and which ones are new additions. Either way, I hate all of it. At number nine, we have missing silver filters. Remember those pile of creepy dolls? Yeah, of course you do. It literally just freaking happened. Well, in addition to the piles of dead dolls, there are also piles of old gas masks everywhere, especially in one old school classroom. Some cheeky and hilarious, sick, person even put some of these masks on dolls. Isn't that great? Anyway, what is mysterious about these gas masks is that these filters inside of all of them have been removed. And these filters contain just a small amount of silver in them. And what is most likely what happened is that looters came and took all of them. But what was done with the silver? No one really knows. If looters did indeed steal them, then I'm guessing that somewhere out there some people have radioactive jewelry or even silverware because they most likely sold it. It's hard to say, but if any of you watching have your own Geiger meters at home right now, I would check it out on anything silver in your home because you might just have a Chernobyl souvenir without even knowing it. At number eight, we have Survivor Immortality. While this one doesn't take place in Chernobyl exactly, it stems from Chernobyl. One Russian scientist who survived the explosion back in 1986 and six other Russian scientists have recently relocated to the small Greek island of Gavdos. There is some conspiracy though because some believe that these scientists actually relocated to the island to become immortal. Gavdos has 50 residents in total on the island and it is believed to have mythical healing powers that make its residents immortal. Reporters from Vice interviewed a filmmaker who was making a documentary on the island and found out that the scientists work on various inventions from inside the local compound. They also have seven acres of land that that was given to them by a priest. Some think these Russian scientists are spies, while others believe they moved out there to not only become immortal themselves, but also clear them of all the radiation using the mystical powers of the island. They are apparently also building a temple named the Temple of Apollo. I think these guys were a little too close to the blast, if you know what I mean. At number seven, we have the random examination chair. Out in the middle of a wooded area in the exclusion zone is a random gynecologist chair. How the hell did it get there? <laughs> no one freaking knows. It can only be assumed that this chair was picked up by some local pranksters who went through the trouble of picking up this radioactive artifact and brought it to a random spot in the woods. But that is so much freaking work. I mean, guys, why? Aside from that, every other possibility is straight up terrifying. Maybe the blast blasted the chair out in the forest, but if if it did, then why was there one of these chairs so close to a freaking radioactive reactor? See, it, it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So it's just another unproven, less than appealing site that can be found in the exclusion zone. At number six, we have silhouettes. You may remember this one from one of my other Chernobyl videos too. The mystery here is we have no idea if these silhouettes are actually based on real people or if it's just a morbid art piece done by another Chernobyl creepy artist. New silhouettes show up all of the time, all over the town of Pripyat, and the only other mystery here is who is behind it? Is it one talented artist or is it a group that has decided to take turns so no one ever gets the true answer? No matter what, these things sure do add to the creep factor of this ghost town, and I'm sure it's also a terrifying sight to see at night. Coming in at a halfway point at number five, we have a Chernobyl cover up. In a documentary titled The Russian Woodpecker, Fodor Alexandrovich explains a conspiracy theory that the Chernobyl blast was actually orchestrated to cover up the failure of the Russian Woodpecker. Now, it wasn't a Russian bird or the Russian version of Woody the Woodpecker. The Russian Woodpecker was actually an array radar that was meant to detect missiles before they were launched. The device was named after its woodpecker like sound it would make during its operation. It cost 7 billion rubles and unfortunately did not work. It is suspected that it didn't work because of the northern lights messing with its signals, but it can't be for certain. So instead of suffering this terrible embarrassment, the Chernobyl plant that was known for its instability blew up, distracting everyone from the failure of the woodpecker. It's hard to say how likely all of this is, but when shooting the woodpecker documentary, apparently some pretty weird stuff happened to the documentary crew, such as visits from secret police services, as well as even one crew member being shot by a hidden sniper during the Euromaiden protests. Whatever the truth is here, it sounds like they were putting their nose 
windows where it wasn't wanted. At number four, we have no containment building. Back in 1986, when the Chernobyl explosion actually happened, there was quite mysteriously no containment building that surrounded the reactors. Usually there are containment structures around radioactive places like the reactors located in Chernobyl. They are gas tight structures that are usually made of steel reinforced concrete so it can confine fission products that could release into the atmosphere during an accident if one were to happen. Sure enough, we all know that one happened here and interestingly enough, it was not prepared for an accident that dangerous. According to author Richard Mueller of the book Physics for Future Presidents, the science behind the headlines, if there would have been a containment unit around the reactors, Mueller believes that there would have been virtually no deaths. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if this coincides with any of the conspiracy of the Russian woodpecker as mentioned before. Maybe. Starting us off in our top three, at number three, we have alien saviors. In this case, they quite literally came in peace. An eyewitness by the name of Mikhail Varitsky claimed to have seen a large fireball of light hovering above the reactor on the night of the explosion. Later on September 16th in 1989, apparently there was another huge radiation leak and it is reported that this same ball of light was seen in the exact same spot once again. Many believe it to be aliens that were actually protecting us from the radioactive blast. Some claim that the blast was nowhere near as big as what it could have been and that these aliens actually helped absorb and clean up whatever extra radiation that they could to save us. You know me, I'm all about the alien theories but I'm not sure about this one. I will say, many say similar events happened during the Fukushima accident as well. Oh well, aliens if you are listening to me right now and you did help us, thank you. Now show yourself. At number two, we had the Black Bird of Chernobyl. In April of 1986, right before the explosion in July, many reported seeing a large creature that looked like a blackbird flying around Chernobyl. This creature was large with red glowing eyes and was compared to America's legend, the Mothman. Why? What's so similar between a large Mothman and a large blackbird? Well, both of these creatures had large glowing red eyes as well as both showed up right before major events. The Mothman appeared and was spotted right before the Silver Bridge collapse in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Virginia in 1967, which reportedly killed 46 people. Some survivors of the Chernobyl blast reported seeing this giant scary creature fly away from the reactor after the blast. Many believe that this bird was a paranormal entity that was a harbinger of terrible things to come. Others believe it was just a large stork. I don't know what to believe here, but the idea of a giant paranormal creature that is similar to the one that was seen in the US 20 years before gives me goosebumps in the best way possible. I love monster and ghost lore, which is what brings us to our number one spot. And finally, coming in at number one, we have my favorite, ghosts. That's right, not just named a ghost town because it's abandoned, but also because there are many different spirits that are said to be found here. Andrei Karsukov, a nuclear physicist from New York, told one story after his visit to the area back in 1997. Karsukov reports that he went to the power station one day at 7.30 a.m. and visited the number four reactor in the sarcophagus. You know, the big containment unit structure that they should have had on there before the explosion? Yeah, that thing. Well, he could not go inside due to the high levels of radiation, but once he was down there, he could hear screams coming from the inside due to a fire. So what did he do? He ran upstairs to the control room to get help, and once he barged open the door, he was told that he was the first person to open that door in three years. He was also told that the only way in was where he was, and if someone came in after him, they would have tripped the alarm. So it was impossible for anyone else to be down there except him. There was also a floodlight that turned on and off at very strange moments, leading the crew to believe someone or something was in the building with them. But what was it? Mm, I don't know. You be the judge. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the disaster. We talk a lot about Chernobyl, but how often do we really discuss how this disaster actually happened in the first place? What actually went on that caused it? The Chernobyl nuclear disaster occurred on April 26th, 1986 in Ukraine, which at the time was a part of the Soviet Union. During a routine safety test, a series of errors and design flaws led to an explosion in reactor 4 of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The explosion caused a massive fire that released radioactive material into the atmosphere, which was carried by wind across Ukraine, Belarus, and other parts of Europe. The disaster was caused by a combination of factors, including a flawed reactor design, a lack of safety, and human error. During the safety test, the reactor's power output dropped to dangerously low levels, leading to an attempt to restore power that resulted in a sudden 
surge. This caused the reactor to overheat, leading to a steam explosion that destroyed the reactor's upper structure. The accident caused immediate deaths due to the explosion, as well as long-term health effects from exposure to radiation. The Chernobyl disaster remains the worst nuclear accident in history in terms of the number of deaths and the environmental impact. It led to significant changes in nuclear safety regulations and increased awareness of the potential risks of nuclear power. In our number 9 spot today, we have The Operator. This story is one that comes directly from Alexei Brius, who is a control room operator at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and this is his story of the day of the disaster, which starts as he was traveling on a bus to work on April 26th, 1986, knowing nothing of the historic disaster that occurred just hours before. As he arrived, he thought, quote, it looked like it would be a mass grave. I was sure that the whole night shift had died there. He continued on to say, quote, at the moment of the explosion, I was in Pripyat in my flat. I was sleeping tightly. I didn't hear. I didn't see anything. In the morning, I was to go to work, and so I did. I knew nothing about the disaster. I just got on a bus and went to work. As I was coming close to the station, I saw from the bus that the block was destroyed. I always say that my hair stood on its end when I saw that. I didn't understand why me and other workers were brought there, but it turned out that there was still much work to be done. Me and my co-workers got off the bus and tried to enter the territory of the fourth block as we were supposed to. There was a guard wearing a rubber-coated army suit who had orders not to let anyone in. Finally, they agreed. The guarding sergeant gave us each a pill of potassium iodide. I took it immediately. It was a special medicine made to protect the thyroid gland from radiation. All my life, I remember him with gratitude. The upper part of the reactor and the separator barrel were open. The main circulating pump was seen from the outside. Down the reactor, I saw the reactor's emergency cooling system all ruined. Its pieces were mixed with slabs of concrete. I was stepping over lumps of black graphite. I didn't want to admit what I saw, just like many other people, that it was black graphite. Alexei goes on to explain that he and the other operators had to, quote, save those injured by fire, debris, hot water, and steam and radiation. We were to find them, carry them out, and deliver them to the medical personnel and go look for others. We saved and brought everybody out, except for one person. He is still somewhere there, inside the reactor. In our number eight spot today, you know, a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a break in the really dark story, we have cows. All right, cows can cheer anybody up. The area around Chernobyl was known for its agriculture before the disaster, so of course that means there were definitely a lot of cows that could be found. While many people who were forced to evacuate had to leave their animals behind, since farm animals are not only expensive, but can also be used as a source of income, many people took their farm animals with them. Unfortunately, however, many of these animals had already been exposed to the radiation in some capacity, and while it didn't affect them right away, the newer generations saw much more of the effects. In 1989, many farmers began reporting birth defects in their animals, some being much more severe than others. As time went on, the cows became less mutated, but that doesn't mean the effects went away. As the cows continued to graze on feed that was contaminated, the effects became more internal. This has led to completely normal looking cows near the exclusion zone to begin producing milk that is toxic and not fit for consumption. While some of the outside and more visible effects of the radiation has worn off, there are still many, many unseen effects that continue to be prevalent today. In our number seven spot today, we have the liquidators. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster, Soviet authorities sent in robots to help with the cleanup efforts in the most hazardous areas. This was an amazing idea until the robots quickly became damaged or destroyed by the high levels of radiation in the environment. The robots faced several challenges, including damage to their electronic components and problems with their movement systems. The high levels of radiation also made it difficult difficult for the robots to function, as the radiation would interfere with the robots' sensors and their controls. Of course, with robots out of the picture, humans were the ones who continued with the cleanup efforts. Known as liquidators, these people were primarily Soviet military personnel, firefighters, and volunteers who were tasked with containing the radioactive material and preventing further contamination, and they faced extreme danger and were exposed to high levels of radiation. Many of these people were working without proper protective gear and in close proximity to the highly radioactive material. Despite these dangers, the liquidators worked tirelessly to contain the disaster and prevent further harm. Many of the liquidators suffered from acute radiation sickness, with symptoms including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Long-term health effects including cancer and other illnesses have also been reported among the liquidators. The liquidators played a very vital role in preventing further harm from the Chernobyl disaster, and they are often referred to as heroes for their bravery and their sacrifice. Many have received 
recognition and awards for their efforts, but many continue to suffer from the long term health effects of their exposure to the radiation. In our number six spot today, we have the abandoned amusement park. The Pripyat Amusement Park, located in the town of Pripyat in Ukraine, was set to open on May 1st, 1986, just days after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. The park was intended to be a celebration of the town's prosperity and the Soviet Union's technological achievements, but it never opened its doors to the public due to the disaster. The park features a Ferris wheel, bumper cars, a carousel, and other rides, which still stand today as an eerie reminder of the town's abandoned past. The Ferris wheel is particularly haunting, with rusted and decaying carts. The amusement park was never fully completed, and its rides were never tested or operated, and today it serves as a chilling symbol of the devastating impact of the Chernobyl disaster on the town and its people. Despite the danger posed by the high levels of radiation in the area, the Pripyat Amusement Park has become a popular destination for tourists seeking to witness the haunting beauty of the abandoned rides and the town itself. In our number 5 spot today, we have the pilot. This is another first-hand account from right after the disaster, and this one comes from Igor Pismensky, who was a helicopter navigator following the disaster. After the meltdown, helicopter crews were sent out to try and spread decontamination materials over the site. One of these crews was actually killed trying to do this work after they crashed at the site. Of the disaster, Igor said, quote, They told us there had been an explosion at the plant, so they needed our help. The mission was, after the firemen, to drop down loads of stuff from helicopters to the destroyed reactor. First sand, then lead, dolomite, boron. We would load up about 15 kilometers distance from the reactor. They would put sandbags into parachutes. Then we would take off and pass around in a conveyor fashion. There would be a circle of up to 40 helicopters in the air, which would fly over and right above the reactor every two to three minutes. No one opened the windows. The chopper was all shut, but it was not airtight. It was not protected against radiation. The view of the destroyed reactor down below, after the main fire had been put out, you could see separate glowing reddish fire beds in the first days. This was the view from the height of 200 meters. Of course, we knew this was dangerous, but what we did not have was adequate protective gear for the mission, but that's the responsibility of those who sent us there. Radiation is considered invisible. It cannot be seen, but you can feel it. That is, you can feel a certain metallic taste in your mouth and a sore throat. Radiation never passes without a trace, so the consequences are always there, and radiation usually hits precisely those parts of the body that are the most vulnerable. So for everyone who's gone through Chernobyl, there are consequences. I remember so well the first time we flew over Pripyat town. The whole town had been evacuated by then, but everything looked sort of surreal. Linen is hanging on laundry lines, on balconies, you see dropped bicycles, abandoned cars, no life around, all people gone, but their stuff is still there. When the catastrophe happened, there was the Soviet Union. We had 15 constituent republics playing their part in handling this mess. Today, no country in the world would be in a position to handle the problem of this magnitude if it happened again. In our number four spot today, we have the elephant's foot. The elephant's foot is a highly radioactive mass of corium that was formed during the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. It is named after its shape, which resembles that of an elephant's foot. The corium was formed when the reactor's core melted down, causing a mixture of melted nuclear fuel, concrete, and other materials to form into a highly radioactive mass. The elephant's foot is estimated to have had a temperature of around 2,700 degrees Celsius at the time of the accident and emitted lethal levels of radiation. The initial workers who tried to remove the elephant's foot from the reactor died within weeks due to the radiation exposure. Today, the elephant's foot remains extremely radioactive and is still inaccessible. It is estimated to be one of the most dangerous objects in the world, with exposure to it resulting in almost certain death within minutes. In our number three spot today, we have Kopachi. Kopachi was a village in Ukraine that was affected by the disaster. The village was situated close to the nuclear power plant, and its residents were exposed to high levels of radiation. To contain the spread of contamination, the Soviet government ordered the evacuation and burial of the village, including burying the contaminated soil under a layer of clean soil. Today, Kopachi remains abandoned and designated as a part of the exclusion zone around the Chernobyl plant. The village and surrounding area serve as a reminder of the devastating consequences of nuclear disasters and the importance of nuclear safety. In our number two spot today, we have the plant. It might come as a surprise, but the Chernobyl nuclear plant didn't just shut down entirely after the disaster. Despite the contamination and the risks associated, they continued to use the plant for years to come. Reactor 4, which exploded during the accident, was completely destroyed, and the other reactors were shut down over time. The Soviet government continued to use parts of the plant for several years to generate electricity and heat for the surrounding area, but eventually
eventually the plant was decommissioned. It wasn't until December of 2000 that the final reactor, Reactor 3, was shut down. Reactor 2 was shut down in 1991 and 1 was shut down in 1996. It is thought that the plant should be fully out of use by 2028. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the containment. After the disaster took place, the damaged reactor, reactor number four, was sealed in a heavy concrete sarcophagus that was meant to keep the radiation concealed and contained. While this may seem like a foolproof plan, there are many debates about how effective this containment actually is and how effective it may or may not continue to be. These are, of course, super important questions, and considering the fact that it's something we've never really had to deal with before in any way, how are we really supposed to know until we try. The building of a new structure called the New Safe Confinement Structure started in 2006 and it was completed in 2017. The new structure is 843 feet wide, 531 feet long, and 356 feet tall and is meant to keep the reactor and its previous sarcophagus contained for at least the next 100 years. Despite that relatively short amount of time, experts say that the exclusion zone and surrounding area will remain uninhabitable for the next 20,000 years. Coming in first in our number 10 spot are abandoned dolls. So if you guys have ever seen one of my videos before, then you might already know I have a specific disdain for creepy dolls. And wouldn't you know it, the exclusion zone is said to be filled with broken and abandoned dolls at every turn. Apparently the specific area is Pripyat, and those that have visited report seeing things like baby dolls sitting in abandoned hospitals, creepy dolls sitting on windowsills, propped up on skeletal bed frames sprawled out in piles of debris and the most creepy of all wearing a gas mask. Now to be fair there is a high possibility that while many of these toys are remnants from the actual disaster there is definitely some tourism interference. But interference or not, many still believe the dolls are haunted. In fact, some visitors swear they've seen the dolls watch them as they walk along the grounds. So whether you are afraid of creepy evil dolls or not, broken dolls without limbs sitting in the middle of a nuclear ghost town is one of my worst nightmares. Coming in at number nine, a natural earthquake. Okay, so I'll start off by saying this might not fully be a creepy encounter, but it's definitely a strange little piece of the puzzle that I had never heard about until now. Apparently back in 1996, there had been a study to explore the possibility of an earthquake being a partial reason for the explosion of reactor four. However, experts quickly revealed that port had over 80 discrepancies, and so it was kind of thrown out as a theory. But the following year, in 1997, a separate group of scientists from the United Institute of the Physics of the Earth decided to revisit the study and they came to an interesting conclusion. So as they reported, the night of April 25th, 1986, which was the night prior to the disaster, three nearby geological stations recorded a relatively weak seismic event. Now, normally this probably wouldn't be cause for concern, but according to the study, the earthquake, albeit small, is thought to have occurred a mere 16 seconds prior to the explosion and could have potentially caused an issue with the proper insertion of the graphite rods designed to protect the reactor as the facility lacked proper protection from seismic movement. I mean, if nothing else, it's definitely a strange little coincidence. Coming in at number eight, weaponized earthquake. Speaking of earthquakes, inside the Chernobyl exclusion zone, there is apparently also some evidence that tectonic weapons were being researched and developed in the Soviet Union at the time. Now, to be clear, it's not known if these weapons were actually ever deployed, but there are some theories out there that suggest that a weaponized earthquake might not be as far-fetched as it sounds. On May 30th, 1992, Pravda, which was the former official newspaper of the Soviet Union, reported that a geophysical or tectonic weapon was actually developed in the USSR despite the UN convention. Pravda, which was the former official newspaper of the Soviet Union, Union reported that a geophysical or tectonic weapon was actually developed in the USSR despite the UN convention. Now, of course, many higher ups denied this, but some are sure that they saw it with their own eyes. I mean, it is an interesting theory and definitely makes you wonder what could have been going on behind closed doors. 
Coming in at number seven, faked photography. So believe it or not, Chernobyl is actually a pretty big tourist destination spot. And along with any tourist destination comes many, many photos. Now, there are some pretty famous photos that we associate with the abandoned area. However, according to photographer Darman Richter, a lot of these photos we see aren't actually authentic, but rather a facade created to make money off those who love dark tourism. Richter, who visited Pripyat for his own photography, said the city was desolate in many ways and still very dangerous. However, a lot of the chilling photos that have become famous online have been manufactured by photographers looking to create the perfect horror shot. Quote, I observed countless instances of tourists moving these artifacts around or repositioning furniture for a better shot. He then says, quote, I watched a photographer arrange stuffed bears and little dolls so that they sat in line along the edge of a bare metal framed bed. I mean, it's no secret that we live in a very curated world where everyone is posting their best moments, but something about trying to curate a disaster zone is definitely a very strange thing to think about. Coming in at number six, immortality seekers. On a little island in Greece called Gavdos, there is an unsuspecting group of seven Russian scientists who have created a commune and set out for the impossible, immortality. Apparently their founder, Andre, had been exposed to high amounts of radiation after a voluntary trip to Chernobyl shortly after the blast. Andre was, of course, advised to go to a clinic in Moscow for treatment. However, believing it was a lost cause, he apparently decided to settle in a small village and live out the rest of his life there. But this is where it gets a little strange. He lived. Now, this is sort of a conspiracy theory, I will admit. However, there are many that believe the scientists chose Gavdos in an attempt to seize control of the Earth and become immortal. The scientists created a tight-knit relationship with the church, and according to a documentary that was being created about the community, quote, they feel they need to reconstruct the world and implement the birth of a new immortal human. Apparently, the scientists even began building a Greek temple where they aim to revive Pythagoras Agrin philosophy and unearth forgotten Greek mysteries. All of which is said to be in the pursuit of immortality. Which, okay, I know it's all a little far fetched, but I mean, if it turns out to be true, it would definitely be creepy. Coming in at number five, Bible predictions. There are a ton of wild predictions out there, and I'll leave it up to you to decide whether or not you think that prophets and seers really do see into the future or not. That being said, there are some out there that believe the Chernobyl disaster was actually predicted in the Bible. According to the book of Revelations, quote, and the third angel sounded the trumpet and a great star fell from heaven, burning as it were a torch, and it fell on the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now, at first you're probably wondering, what on earth could that have to do with Chernobyl? Well, apparently in Russian, Chernobyl is said to mean wormwood. Now, could this be a coincidence? Sure, but it is definitely a bit strange. On top of that, the fires from reactor four have been likened to a torch, and it's believed the third trumpet referred to the accident itself, while the bitter water had to do with radiation. So what do you think? Was disaster predicted in the Bible? Coming in at number four, mutated farm animals. At first, it might sound like something from a science fiction novel, but according to Thought Co., just after the disaster, and again in 1989 to 1990, there was a huge spike in malformed farm animals. Many believe this phenomenon coincides with a failure of the sarcophagus, which was a concrete tomb that crews built around the failed reactor in the hope that it would stop leaking radiation or producing deformed farm animals, which as we know now, didn't quite work out as hoped. Among the mutations seen in the local cattle, pigs, goats, and horses born in the area after the disaster, some suffered from intensely messed up faces, extra limbs, dwarfism, or unnatural colors. In fact, one tiny little piglet became a well-known victim of the radiation. The poor little thing suffered from a mutation called dipgus, which is when they have duplicated lower limbs, and it uh, is definitely not a great sight, I will say that much. I mean, I love little piglets, but this one is definitely giving 
giving off more of a creepy horror movie vibe. That being said, you don't need to take my word for it. If you like, you can actually see it for yourself as it is apparently on display at the Ukrainian National Chernobyl Museum. Coming in at number three, graffiti. While you might think that most people would try to stay as far away as possible from nuclear disaster zones, there are a ton of people that sneak into the exclusion zone all the time. In particular, a group of graffiti artists who left behind some eerie art all over Pripyat. Painted to appear as permanent shadows, assumingly like the actual ones left on the buildings in Hiroshima after their respective nuclear attack, creepy black silhouettes adorn the abandoned city creeping out everyone who sees them. In one room, a little girl with bows in her pigtails reaches for a light switch, while outside, a boy pulls a toy truck toward the corner of a building. On other walls, the figures appear to dance, and in a separate section, three young people are jumping, or as some speculate, floating, holding on to each other in terror. Those that have seen them in person say they are incredibly eerie and haunting. And some have even ventured to say that the spirits of the lost souls could live inside the walls, haunting the tourists who walk past. Coming in at number two, aliens. There are definitely tons of theories surrounding alien involvement in the Chernobyl disaster. And while most theories are actually on the more positive side, with witnesses claiming they saw aliens stopping the disaster from getting worse, one witness, Mikhail Varitsky, had a slightly different experience. Quote, I and other people from my team went to the site of the blast at night. We saw a ball of fire and it was slowly flying in the sky. I think the ball was six or eight meters in diameter. Then we saw two rays of crimson light stretching towards the fourth unit. The object was some 300 meters from the reactor. The event lasted for about three minutes. The lights of the object went out and it flew away in the northwestern direction. Now the question here is, was the alien a part of the other group that people say were here to save the planet? Or were they some kind of rival that was interfering and making matters worse. I mean, honestly, I haven't one sweet clue, but any alleged UFO site is spooky in my books. And last up today in our number one spot, the ghosts. Considering that Chernobyl was the location of many deaths, it's not a huge shock that many claim to have witnessed ghosts roaming around the abandoned grounds. But one story in particular really sent shivers down my spine. Andrei Karsakov, a nuclear physicist, was visiting the area back in 1997 and says one morning he arrived at 7.30 and headed over to the number four reactor sarcophagus to measure radiation, where the infamous explosion had occurred. Obviously, he was not allowed inside due to the radiation, but as he was taking readings of the radiation from outside, he says he began hearing someone screaming for help from the inside. Quote, I ran upstairs to tell someone, but they said that when I entered the reactor control room, I was the first person to open that door in three years. And the only way to get inside the old reactor is through the doors I came in through. If someone had gone inside the reactor when I was not looking, they would have tripped an alarm that goes off when the reactor door is opened mechanically. He went on to explain that the reactor door also requires a password and a handprint, yet he swore he heard someone screaming for help. Then later that evening, as they were eating, he noticed a floodlight turn on, which should have been impossible since there was no way anyone could be inside. Apparently his colleague tried to ease his suspicions by saying it could have been a power surge, but just as his colleague said that, the light snapped off, as if someone was inside listening to their conversation the whole time. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the reactor visit. This is a story that was told by a nuclear physicist from New York, Andrei Karsukov, and he told this story after he visited Chernobyl in 1997. During this visit, he went to the power station around 7.30 a.m., and he went into what was left of reactor number four. This is where the explosion occurred. He began to take some radiation level readings, but suddenly he began to hear someone scream. He said, quote, I ran upstairs to tell someone, but they said that when I entered the 
reactor control room, I was the first person to open that door in three years, and the only way to get inside the old reactor is through the doors I came in through. If someone had gone inside the reactor when I was not looking, they would have tripped an alarm that goes off when the reactor door is opened mechanically. The reactor door requires a password and a handprint, yet someone or something was inside. Later that evening, as we were eating dinner outside the building by the river next to the plant, a floodlight turned on in the room of the installation. There was no way anyone could be inside. As we ate, we figured there was a power surge or something. Then, just as my colleague said that, the light turned off. Maybe the reactor itself is now haunted by the souls who lost their lives as a result of the meltdown. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Chernobyl ghosts. While you can visit certain parts of Chernobyl today that have been deemed safe, taking a trip may not be for everyone, or perhaps it's too far, or whatever hundred reasons there are for not visiting the site. But with the technology we have now, there's another way you can visit the site, and that is through trusty old Google Maps. Many internet people have walked through the streets of the exclusion zone searching around, seeing what photos Google Maps holds. But with those virtual tours comes something that is absolutely terrifying people, and that is the apparent sightings of what is referred to as the ghosts of Chernobyl. People have reported seeing shadowy figures, sometimes even faces in the abandoned buildings left in the exclusion zone, and I have to admit, some of the screenshots I've seen are pretty terrifying. Do you believe these are real ghosts caught on camera, or is it just a legend like many of the other things on today's list? In our number 8 spot today, we have the Blackbird. People in the district of the Ukraine that houses Chernobyl have told stories of sightings of the Blackbird for years, and it is perhaps the most well-known legend that comes from the area. The Blackbird is a human creature with wings and piercing red eyes, and it was apparently seen by workers at the Chernobyl plant on the fateful day of the nuclear disaster. After this, it was reported that anyone who had seen the bird would later report suffering from terrible nightmares and begin receiving threatening phone calls. Many of the people where the legend originates from, unfortunately, were at the center of the disaster and have since passed away from the radiation poisoning, so no one is sure if the blackbird really is out there or not. The blackbird is said to be a symbol of something terrible being afoot, so seeing it is definitely not a great thing to happen to a person. I think it's probably just another one to add to the list of reasons why maybe a Chernobyl visit isn't the best idea. I don't know, okay? It's for your health. In our number 7 spot today, we have the government cover-up. Of course, a disaster like this is going to get some government conspiracies swirling around it, and this little ditty suggests that the Chernobyl disaster was actually conducted by the Soviet government due to the failure of a new, at the time, huge missile defense radio structure called Duga-3. This structure, that actually exists in real life, is suspected of having been wildly over budget, and it was the source of many, many complaints after it was built. The systems were extremely powerful and broadcast in shortwave radio bands. They would appear without warning and sounded like a sharp, repetitive tapping noise, and they would disrupt things like legitimate broadcasts, amateur radio, commercial aviation communications, and utility transmissions, which all led to there being international complaints, and at the time, people didn't know what it was. This strange noise actually would go on to gain the tower the nickname Woodpecker for an idea of what the sound sounded like. Because of the fact that people didn't know where the sound was coming from, it led them to think that the signal was actually being used for things such as Soviet mind control or weather control experiments. So the story suggests that in order to eliminate it, the nearby Chernobyl facility was allowed to go into meltdown. It seems like they probably could have done something much less lethal and much less damaging, so I'm not exactly sure how true this one could possibly be, but there are definitely people out there who believe it. In our number sixth spot today, we have the spiders. The spiders that are residing within the exclusion zone are, of course, radioactive, but it's not only the spiders that are now dangerous to touch, it's also their webs. Spiders in Chernobyl are literally making radioactive webs, which is the stuff straight out of a comic book. These radioactive webs are also being woven in much different ways than they once were, which would suggest, of course, some sort of genetic mutation is at play. Spiders were already a creature I'd like to stay far, far away from. I feel just like tingly talking about them, but radioactive spiders adds a whole new level. Not only are the spiders now dangerous for non-radioactive animals to touch, but walking through their web is equally as dangerous to those who aren't thriving in the radiation. So not only do you have to watch out for regular old radioactive material, but now also get the never-ending construction of radioactive webs. That's amazing. It's so great. In our number five spot today, we have the alien invasion. Okay, it seems absolutely 
insane, but there is an alien conspiracy that actually revolves around Chernobyl, and there are people who believe it's true. There is part of this theory that I like, and that is because it basically suggests that aliens saved humanity. Yeah, in this story, they didn't cause disaster or try to steal our planet, and instead, they saved us from a complete and total meltdown. What happened, and how this all started, is that around the same time of the Chernobyl disaster, people reported spotting a number of UFOs. One witness even said that they saw a UFO for six hours. So basically, because of this uptick in sightings, people believe that the aliens came to help sort of diffuse some of the radiation levels that were seen after the disaster. This would have helped to prevent an even larger blast with an even higher amount of death and illness. This is sort of a conspiracy brought up to explain how, while this meltdown was of course catastrophic, it didn't leave like apocalyptic level damage, which believers of this theory said there should have been. So what do we think? Did aliens come to save the planet? In our number four spot today, we have The Musician. This is a story that comes from a Redditor named Jake, but this actually isn't Jake's story. This is the story of a man named Yuri who Jake met at a bar in Finland. Yuri is actually a Chernobyl survivor, and he had quite the harrowing tale to share with Jake. Yuri is a musician, and at the time of the disaster, he was in a state-sponsored musical dance troupe. Basically, as soon as the disaster happened, this group was called upon by the government to come in and calm the people living in the area. Yuri said, quote, Mere hours after the meltdown commenced, our bus entered the exclusion zone at checkpoint Ditjatki. We were told not anything, and the soldiers made it forbidden for speaking with the village people. Imagine not knowing a disaster taking place, yet seeing the strange workings of the radioactivity all around. Everyone was sick and dying, yet quarantined and not allowed to leave the zone. This is all chilling, but this is where the story takes a terrifying turn. He begins to describe their final performance, which was in Pripyat. The ballerina danced, knowing something horrible had happened, and she danced like never before, and she even let her hair down from her bun to just let it flow. Suddenly though, Yuri noticed that these locks of hair weren't just falling out of her bun, they were falling down. To the ground. Basically, Yuri ends off his story by explaining his escape, which was through back roads and avoiding military checkpoints, and he ends off by saying that he is the only one of his group to survive. In our number three spot today, we have barn swallows. Any animal who lives in the exclusion zone has to have been affected by the disaster, and that includes those who spend most of their time in the sky. I'm obviously talking about birds. The barn swallows in Chernobyl are one animal who have seen a change in their physical appearance that has lasted all of the years since the nuclear meltdown. It is unclear why these birds have been affected greater than their land animal counterparts, or if these changes will ever reverse to their previous state, but here's what they are currently dealing with. The swallows appeared to have severely deformed beaks, disproportionate feathers, some had partial albinism, and they were seen to have had much smaller brains. Of course, some of these issues are much worse than others, and I'm sure these changes have significantly affected their ways of life, but of course, they continue to adapt as time goes on. It is sad that this human-made disaster has affected them in such a negative way, but the fact that they are still around really shows their adaptability and their resilience. In our number two spot today, we have the Chernobyl Zombies. This little legend that comes from within the exclusion zone claims that after the Chernobyl disaster, we of course know that unfortunately people lost their lives, but what happened if those who did then became the undead? We're obviously talking about zombies here. There are plenty of legends that suggest to the exclusion zone isn't dangerous and off limits because of the toxic radiation, but actually because there are brain eating zombies wandering the area. I mean, I personally have never received a lethal dose of radiation, so I cannot confirm nor deny that this would turn one into a zombie, but I'm gonna go ahead and call this one most likely fake. I mean, at least I am really, really, really hoping it is. We're dealing with enough as a society. We don't need zombies on the list. This little legend can most likely be attributed to a video game that takes place in the exclusion zone, but it certainly is not based on any real life facts, at least that we know of. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have The Stalkers. Speaking of that video game, which is called Docker, it might have inspired the tales of the zombies, but it also apparently has inspired some to try and sneak into the exclusion zone themselves. This popular game set in the zone has made some people try and sneak into it themselves 
themselves in real life in order to live out the game. You know, like a LARPing scenario, but the only enemy this time is radiation. Basically, there are these people who are now being referred to as stalkers, and they are said to be sort of romanticizing the exclusion zone. They like to sneak in, explore the ruins, sleep in the abandoned buildings, and sometimes even bring in a device to show them how much radiation they are being exposed to, which is pretty frightening. Despite these dangerous explorers sharing their nickname with the video game, however, the name actually comes from characters in the novel Roadside Picnic, which was turned into a classic Soviet film entitled Stalker, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. The term stalker is meant to refer to thieves who sneak into places that are harboring lethal secrets. Some even tried to tempt fate even more by doing things like eating fruit that they found growing in the zone. Because of the fact that this place is meant to be off limits, many of those sneaking in here who consider themselves stalkers wear things like paramilitary gear, they wear gas masks, balaclavas, and other things to cover their face. All in all, it's very dangerous and also very unsettling. Starting off this countdown, we have the sarcophagus. Basically, this is a massive steel and concrete structure that covers the Chernobyl power plant. It was designed to help contain the radiation. The construction of the structure lasted for 206 days, and those working on it had to work in shifts of no more than 7 minutes. Any more time spent near the reactors would have killed them. But still, they did sacrifice their lives building this because thousands of workers still died from exposure to the radiation. Those that survived got severely ill, and the majority of them developed cancer. Nowadays, the sarcophagus is still there, but it's beginning to crumble. In 2019, they were in the process of dismantling it because it was going to collapse. So a new one is currently being installed. That's probably the scariest thing in Chernobyl because of how deadly the building it's containing is. Coming in at number 9 we have the gas masks, and if you guys are liking this video or want to see part 3 then smash that like button. Chernobyl already looks like the place where an apocalypse occurred. Buildings are completely abandoned, run down, and overgrown with nature. What doesn't help is the piles upon piles of gas masks scattered all throughout Chernobyl. This really adds to the eeriness of this place, and again, makes it look like a place where a zombie or alien takeover occurred. In fact, there is one room inside a school which is just completely filled with child size gas masks. It's very creepy, but also sad. Like imagine how frightened the young children were when this happened. The gas masks found there are just a sad reminder of the horrors that took place there when the reactor exploded. Moving on to number 8 we have the rotting toys. Littered all throughout the city are toys or personal belongings people had to leave behind. The saddest thing to see are pictures of children's toys left behind. Like I just think that was probably someone's favorite little dolly. Go anywhere there and you'll find items scattered everywhere, now broken and covered in filth. Like imagine, you're rushed out of your home and have to leave behind all your personal belongings. That must have been so hard, I can't imagine how everyone must have felt. It's really depressing to think about. Moving on at number 7 we have the examination chair. So uh, this one is pretty strange, but somehow a gynecologist examination chair ended up in the middle of the woods outside of a hospital. Not only is that super weird, but it's also super creepy. It's all rusted and beat up and looks like an old torture device. Not only that, but that means someone had to go inside the abandoned hospital, find that chair, and then carry it all the way back down and into the woods. I got a lot of questions. Why would someone do this? And how long did it take them to do this? And again, why would someone do this? Either way, it makes for a very spooky encounter. Moving on at number 6 we have the abandoned cooling tower. A partially constructed cooling tower can be found at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. They were built to evaporate the cooling water from the two new reactors. Sadly, they were never completed. Now, these things are massive. The diameter was over 120 meters, and it stands at 150 meters tall. Obviously, after the accident, there was no need to continue on with the construction of this, so the government just left the towers there along with everything else. Eventually, over time, nature will have its way with it, and it will start to erode and crumble. It's just crazy seeing all these abandoned infrastructures. Imagine how life would have been if that explosion never happened. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the toxic river. There's a river that's just filled with radioactive water right near the reactor. The scariest part is despite how toxic the water is, a bunch of aquatic life live there. 
in particular, giant catfish. Yes, giant catfish. A video from 2016 shows a massive catfish swimming in the water. People originally were like, oh my god, what the heck is that? It must be some sort of mutated animal. Later, it was just found out to be a giant catfish. But still, what the heck? And it's the fact that they have adapted to be able to survive in that highly toxic water. Like, that just baffles me. Not only that, but they can thrive there because the water has no higher predators. Obviously, though, you're not allowed to go fishing there. Okay, I feel like that's a given, but I also feel like people would still try it, so I'm just gonna say it. Don't go fishing there. In our fourth spot, we have the jarfish. Speaking of fish, we're gonna go with this. So back in 2016, photographer and journalist Miriam Wazer took a trip to explore the ruins of Chernobyl. While inside an abandoned building, she came across something very creepy and odd. She found a bunch of fish and other specimen in jars. Why someone was collecting fish, it just baffles many. And they weren't even like proper beakers or science mason jars. No, no, it looked like someone emptied out their jar of pickles and then used it to store the specimen. I think it's best if those remain untouched. Like, can you imagine how stinky they would be if they were open nowadays? They would reek. Old stinky fish is not something I would ever want to handle. Now the other specimen beside the fish are unknown. No one knows what the heck they are. But if you know, let me know in the comments below. Coming in at number three, we have the abandoned hospitals. The hospitals at Chernobyl are quite eerie. They're just filled with rusted, empty hospital beds, littered syringes, and more. The walls and floors are cracking, and there's dirt and questionable red marks on the floor. I think the saddest thing, though, is that these hospitals are often trashed with medical supplies just tossed everywhere. The days after the explosion happened, people were frantically rushing to hospitals. Hospital staff were overwhelmed by the amount of people there. This moment is still preserved in the hospitals to this day. It's pretty dark once you think about it. And at number two today, we have the Sad Alley. The Sad Alley, or the Alley of Memory, is an alley in the Ukraine created in memory of the villages and residents who had to flee from their homes during the disaster. Basically, it's a walkway with signs lining the sides. These signs are names of cities and villages that had to evacuate and leave everything behind. It's a way to ensure we just never forget the impact that this disaster had. It's really sad. And in our number one spot today, we have the radioactive spiders. Yes, you heard me correctly. Imagine if Peter Parker got bit by one of these bad guys. He'd be like a weirdly mutated Spider-Man or something like that. But anyways, the spiders in the exclusion zone are radioactive. So you definitely don't want to be bit by one. Oh wait, it gets worse. They also make radioactive webs. Yeah, you heard me, that's a thing. So you don't have to just worry about these spiders, but you have to worry about walking through their deadly webs. Like, what the heck? No thank you, nah, -uh. I'm not a fan of spiders, but imagine radioactive ones. That sounds like it belongs in a horror movie. Radioactive, radioactive. Starting off this countdown, we have the residents. Believe it or not, but there are people that still live in Chernobyl, even though it's highly dangerous to do so. It's estimated that there are around 130 to 150 people currently living there. Many of them are older women. In fact, they have been given the name Chernobyl's Babushkas. Now, you may be wondering, how do they live there when there's no operating grocery store and stuff like that? Well, they live off of the land. They are still farming their family's land. The thing is, the water and soil there is still highly contaminated. So why would they take this risk? Well, one of the elderly ladies featured in a documentary about Chernobyl's Babushkas said, and I quote, Radiation doesn't scare me, starvation does. After the nuclear disasters, these ladies fled their home, but over the years, they have all come back. Despite there being no hospitals or grocery stores, they don't care. They just wanna be on their homeland. And turns out, their bodies have somewhat adjusted to the high levels of radiation there. In our ninth spot, we have the radioactive animals. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then make sure to give it a big thumbs up. The nuclear power plant explosion had a lasting effect on the animals in the area. First off, family Families had to flee their home and leave their pets behind. As a result, a number of stray dogs that are descendants of those dogs still roam the area. But it's not safe to pet them, no matter how cute they are. And sadly, because of their exposure to the radiation, they don't live a long life. And many of them have health issues. Another animal that is highly
highly radioactive there are the boars. This is because they eat grubs, tubers, and roots in the soil where the radioactive isotopes have settled. Not only that, but birds and rodents have been found with tumors and cataracts, all from being exposed to the radiation in the area. Coming in at number eight, we have the creepy doll beds. There are a bunch of people who go around Chernobyl purposely trying to make it creepier. They have been given the name the disaster tourists. They have been known to take creepy old dolls and place them on windowsills or hang them from buildings, etc. They also did this really creepy thing in an abandoned school. They rearranged a kindergarten classroom and placed a doll on every single one of those dilapidated beds. That literally looks like something straight out of a horror movie. Seriously, out of all the abandoned places there, that one looks like it would for sure be haunted. In our seventh spot today, we have the ghostly figure. There are tons of ghosts that haunt Chernobyl. I mean, any place where a huge tragedy takes place is bound to be haunted. In this case, the ghost was captured on live TV. So sci-fi channel's Destination Truth went to Chernobyl and conducted a number of paranormal investigations. They even went to Reactor 4. While there, they saw a human figure appear on a thermal imaging camera. They believe that that is the soul of a worker that died from the explosion. They also checked out a number of abandoned hospitals and saw multiple figures moving throughout the hospital on the thermal imaging camera as well. Isn't that spooky? Moving on to number six, we have the elephant's foot. The elephant's foot is a large mass of black choria. It's given the name the elephant's foot because it's shaped sort of like an elephant's foot. Now, this thing is highly deadly. It emits high levels of radiation. Anyone exposed to it for minutes could die from radiation poisoning. And guess what? Although it's not as active as it was back in the day, it is still generating heat and still melting down into the base of Chernobyl. The scariest part, if it comes in contact with water, another explosion could occur. Now, eventually the elephant's foot will cool on its own, but even then it will still remain highly radioactive. And no one should ever go near it. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the raccoon dog. This is a really freaking weird animal found in Chernobyl. When people first saw it, they actually thought the radiation caused a dog and a raccoon to just fuse together. Basically, they are found all throughout the exclusion zone and they are thriving there. It's crazy to see how they have adapted to live in a highly radioactive area. Now, these things are freaking cute. In fact, they are the most observed animals in that area by scientists. Coming in at number four, we have the fire bug. These are tiny but deadly radioactive bugs. They were discovered back in 2011 when two friends were out collecting flowers in the exclusion zone. Don't worry, they were doing this for scientific reasons, you know, to study the pollen, not to just create a deadly radioactive bouquet of flowers. Anyways, while doing so, they came across these fire bugs. They then went around collecting hundreds of these bugs, some from areas with higher levels of radiation and some from areas with lower radiation levels. In the end, they found that those exposed to higher levels of radiation had deformities. I mean, yeah, just as you suspected. Either way, you don't want those bad boys crawling on your skin for a number of reasons. In our third spot today, we have the mutated wolves. The wolves from Chernobyl are another animal that are most commonly studied by scientists. In fact, some have been tagged with GPS collars to help track the levels of radioactivity there. Here's the thing. There was this whole scary legend going around that the wolves living there got mutated and were now highly aggressive and massive in size. There were stories being told of these massive wolves hunting down humans and attacking any and every animal. Turns out that this was false. But here's something interesting. Scientists believe that the wolves there have been mating with the dogs there. And in the end, they are creating these large dogs that look like wolves. It's pretty interesting. I, I want a wolf dog. Another interesting interesting thing is that research has shown that the radiation isn't really affecting them. In fact, the wolf population is thriving there. As a result, they have concluded that humans have a greater negative impact on animals' lives than radiation does. Isn't that insane? It is said that there are around 300 wolves living in the exclusion zone. But again, like all the animals mentioned on this list, they are highly radioactive and dangerous to get close to or even pet. Coming in at number two, we have the tombs. This is one of the saddest things at Chernobyl. But basically, a number of individuals that got exposed to the radioactive materials and died had to be buried in basically a big concrete 
coffin. Let's take a look at a man named Vasily Ignatenko. On that day, he went to the roof of the power plant to extinguish the fires. Sadly, he was exposed to a lethal dose of radiation and passed away. He was only 25. Now, his body was still radioactive. So Vasily, along with 27 other firefighters, were buried under big amounts of zinc and concrete. They did this to protect the public from the radiation emitting from their bodies. They were buried all around the reactor. It's really sad that they didn't really get a proper burial. I mean, they couldn't. It was too dangerous to go near their bodies. And in our number one spot today, we have the Blackbird of Chernobyl. According to some survivors of this accident, they claim that shortly before the nuclear plant meltdown, they all experienced nightmares. They also received threatening phone calls and had encountered a huge winged bird creature. Legend goes that these were all warning signs that the disaster was going to happen. The creature they saw was a large creature like a man with huge wings and red eyes. Some even claim they saw it over one of the reactors as it went through the meltdown. This creature has been given the name the black bird of Chernobyl. So legend goes, if you were in Chernobyl and you see this creature, then something bad is going to happen. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have cows. Cows are one of the sweetest and cutest animals out there and it totally makes sense why people call them grass puppies. The area around Chernobyl was known for its agriculture before the disaster, so of course that means there were definitely a lot of cows that could be found. Since farm animals are not only expensive, but can also be used as a source of income, many people took their farm animals with them, but many of these animals had already been exposed to the radiation in some capacity, and while it didn't affect them right away, the newer generations saw much more of the effects. In 1989, many farmers began reporting birth defects in their animals, some being much more severe than others. As time went on, the cows became less mutated, but that doesn't mean the effects went away. As the cows continued to graze on feed that was contaminated, the effects became more internal. This has led completely normal looking cows near the exclusion zone to be begin producing milk that is toxic and not fit for consumption. This is just one of the clear examples of how even though the visible effects may have worn off, there are still lasting effects that we probably hadn't previously considered. In our number 9 spot today we have barn swallows. Any animal who lives in the exclusion zone have been affected by the disaster and that includes those who spend most of their time in the sky. I'm obviously talking about birds. The barn swallows in Chernobyl are one animal who have seen a change in their physical appearance that has lasted all all of the years since the nuclear meltdown. It is unclear why these birds have been affected greater than their land animal counterparts or if these changes will ever reverse to their previous state, but here's what they are currently dealing with. The swallows appear to have severely deformed beaks, disproportionate feathers, some had partial albinism, and they were seen to have much smaller brains. Of course, some of these issues are much worse than others, and I'm sure these changes have significantly affected their ways of life, but of course they continue to adapt as time goes on. It is sad that this human made disaster has affected them in such a negative way, but the fact that they are still around really shows their adaptability and resilience. In our number 8 spot today we have boars. Boars are often seen wandering around the exclusion zone, but they also make their way into the surrounding towns as well, which is creating quite a problem. Boars are a fairly common food source and it's not unusual to come across one, but here's the problem if you live in the area, how are you supposed to tell which boars are radioactive and which aren't? Basically, you can't until it's too late. The boars who aren't radioactive might come across and intermingle with one who is, but they also like to eat mushrooms, and if they're searching for their food within the exclusion zone, it's a highly likely possibility that they'll find themselves eating a radioactive mushroom. This is posing quite a problem. In 2017, there was a study that found that approximately one out of every three boars that were killed in the nearby areas of Germany, which for the record isn't even that close to Chernobyl, have been found to be radioactive and super unsafe for human consumption. You'd think that being that far away would make you safe, but as we clearly now know, the effects of the disaster stretched far and wide. In our number 7 spot today we have Shavalsky's horse. These horses first originated in Mongolia and were wild horses that became endangered. They first became endangered due to hunters who would often kill the stallion, which of course would provide many difficulties in terms of reproduction. These horses weren't doing well in captivity, which made things even more difficult. This combined with the harsh winter 
hunters, which would often claim their lives, left things looking quite grim for this species. In the late 1990s, however, in an effort to help repopulate these animals, 30 of them were released into the Ukrainian side of the exclusion zone, and it is believed that some of these original horses are actually still alive today, which is amazing, but camera trap images have also shown young horses, which means that they are repopulating, which is a huge win. Their expanding population in such a harsh environment could mean that they might potentially be able to return from the brink and go on to continue as a species, which is something we always want to see. In our number six spot today, we have cats. In the rush of the evacuation, many pets were left behind in Chernobyl, and that of course includes cats. With little to do and of course more kittens being born, this paved the way for a group of feral cats to take over the exclusion zone. These cats wander in and out of the zone and find all of their favorite snacks, such as radioactive rodents or the less common radioactive insects. These cats certainly have had quite a difficult time surviving as they are a perfect tasty snack for much larger predators and are certainly not equipped to deal with the harsh winters, but even still there is said to be at least a hundred stray cats living in the exclusion zone. There are efforts underway to have the uncontaminated ones put up for adoption, but the difficulty is in testing them and also re-domesticating these animals who have had to fend for themselves for so long. In our number 5 spot today we have dogs. Since we just talked about the cats who were sadly left behind, it's only fair we talk about the dogs too. It's strange that these two domesticated animals would have such different experiences after the disaster, but they absolutely have. There are far more dogs who have managed to survive throughout the years than cats, but that is most likely due to the fact that they aren't as easy to catch and eat as prey as cats are. But dogs have a whole other challenge, and that is they have a hard time hunting and feeding themselves. There are workers who continue to work the dangerous job at the plant, and they continually feed the dogs living in the zone, which is something that truthfully is so nice to hear. It is also said that there are dogs living in this area that have begun mating with wolves, which is only going to breed dogs that will be more likely to be able to survive on their own, which I suppose is a good thing. Similar to the cats, many of the stray dogs are being studied to see if they can be adopted into homes outside of the zone so that they don't have to continue living in these harsh environments that they really were not bred for. In our number 4 spot today we have European Grey Wolves. One of the species of animals that has been thriving ever since the disastrous nuclear meltdown has been the European Grey Wolf. Due to the lack of humans in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, they have been able to thrive and it has been said that the wolves in this area actually have a population that is 7 times higher than that of comparable sites. Researchers are still trying to figure out exactly why this is happening, but it has obviously shown them that despite the effects of radiation in humans, the radiation clearly isn't affecting the wildlife's ability to reproduce. So this seems like just a regular grey wolf, but here's where things get a little different. Just because the wolves seem to be doing fine doesn't mean they aren't radioactive. These wolves, since they're such a high population, are beginning to travel farther and spread out more, which creates quite a problem. Not that we're just going up and petting wolves, but if you did come in contact with one of these wolves, you'd be getting a high dose of radiation just by touching them. Touching a carcass of these wolves with bare hands is absolutely not recommended. So while it is absolutely incredible to see the wildlife doing so well in this zone, we are now faced with an entirely different issue that we haven't really ever had before. In our number 3 spot today we have the Eurasian Lynx. This one is on this list for a different reason than most. It isn't because of anything this animal is or isn't doing, but instead is due to the fact that this animal was once believed to have entirely disappeared from Europe. It was fairly recently in 2014 that researchers realized they had made a comeback in a big way. Similar to most of the animals we've talked about today, the Eurasian lynx has been able to thrive due to the lack of human population and interference. Their downfall was attributed to urbanization as well as hunters, and they were mostly wiped out in the early 20th century, although they remained in certain parts of Siberia. There is still a lot more research that needs to be done about these creatures to determine exactly how radioactive they are, and this will take time due to the dangers of the zone they reside in, as well as the nature of these creatures in general. But just being able to see that an animal that was struggling has been able to make such a comeback is probably one of the best things to come out of such a horrible disaster. In our number 2 spot today we have bison. Bison are right up there with wolves for most dangerous radioactive animal and that is due to their size as well as the fact that they are a source of food for some. These huge animals can weigh up to 2,200 pounds and are certainly not an animal that is easily messed with. Many bison weren't affected by the radiation immediately and instead it became much more of an issue once they started eating food that had been contaminated. They like to feed on grass, and a lot of it, and the 
radiation didn't only affect animal life, but plant life as well, making their food source a literal feeding ground for radioactive material. Similar to the wolves we talked about before, running into these guys isn't only a threat now because of their size, but now because if you get too close, you could be facing some unsafe levels of radiation. In our number one spot today, we have spiders. I've talked about my hatred for spiders a lot on this channel, but to be honest, they keep doing cool things, so I have to keep talking about them. Okay, well maybe this one is less cool and more scary, but still, they deserve a spot. Spiders that are residing within the exclusion zone are of course radioactive, but it's not only the spiders that are now dangerous to touch, but it is also their webs. Spiders in Chernobyl are literally making radioactive webs, which is the stuff straight out of a comic book. These radioactive webs are also being woven in much different ways than they were before, which would suggest some sort of genetic mutation at play. Spiders were already a creature I'd like to stay far, far away from, but radioactive spiders really adds a whole other level. Not only are the spiders now dangerous for non-radioactive animals to touch, but walking through their web is equally as dangerous to those who aren't thriving in the radiation. So not only do you have to watch out for the regular old radioactive material, but now also the never-ending construction of radioactive webs. Great. Mm -hmm. 